Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Renfrew Center Foundation's webinar, Voice of Inspiration, a conversation with alum Erica Lee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Erin Byerly, and I'm your Alumni Services Coordinator, and I'll be your moderator for today's online presentation. So before I introduce you all to Erica Lee, I want to go over a few announcements and give others a little bit of extra time to join. So first off, there is still plenty of time to register for our upcoming alumni webinar rebroadcast this summer. We'll be rebroadcasting our webinar from Megan Brown on grieving diet culture and another one from Ashley Moser on moving from self-criticism to self-compassion. This is a great way to get a little extra support during the summer months. And you can find registration for these events on renfrewcenter.com slash events. We're also continuing to host our residential alumni support group monthly. The next meeting is scheduled for June 20th, Tuesday from four until 5 p.m. And in addition, we also still have our weekly BIPOC and SAGE outpatient groups. Um, and we are also really excited to announce that registration is open for our non-residential summer workshops. They're happening in person at most of our sites on either June 20th or June 21st, running from 6 until 8 p.m. locally. We are also offering two virtual options for those who are unable to attend in person. And we'll be talking during this workshop about making a splash in recovery. It'll be a great little summer pick me up and get, giving you a great chance to reconnect with the staff at your local Renfrew site. Registration for these events and more are on the events page of renfrewcenter.com. So definitely check it out and see what's on there and get registered for the ones that are of interest to you. And as always, if you feel like you need more support at this time or in the future, please feel free to reach out to 1-800-RENFREW um, and we'll be able to get you in touch, connect with more people, um, see what kind of support we can offer for you. So we will be having a question and answer session following the presentation. You can submit questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the chat function. Make sure you're just sending them to all panelists and not everyone. So your question is just going to Erica and I and not to the entire group. We will also be emailing you an evaluation form via email that you can complete online. And this evaluation form is really helpful to us to help us develop new and innovative programs, different things that are going to assist in your recovery. So I'd like to now introduce you all to today's presenter, Erica Lee Averill resides in Salisbury, North Carolina. I had it, Erica, and then I think I butchered it. So I apologize if I messed up your last name. But Erica attended high school at Forest View High School, graduating early to attend Savannah College of Art and Design and pursue a degree in the arts. Erica is now representing North Carolina as Miss North Carolina Petite 2023 and has a beautiful 11-year-old daughter. Erica is known for her breadth of artisanal expression and is classically trained in dance, photography, drawing, painting, and acting. After college, Erica returned to her native North Carolina to continue her dancing, choreography, and acting career. Her recent work include lead performances in the short films When I Grow Up, For Love, and Little Angel, and previously she choreographed and performed her original dance entitled Reasons Not to Die at the Loose Leaves Showcase in Charlotte, North Carolina. She has recently taught intermediate and advanced classes in ballet and contemporary dance across the state, and she's also taught master classes internationally in Canada. Erica's platform is eating disorder awareness, and she's been working with national treatment centers and hospitals to get help for women who are in situations that Erica has been in in the past. Knowing that eating disorders are secretive and also on the rise, Erica has been traveling to give speeches and has recently launched Project Sea Glass. Sea glass represents shards of glass that have been tumbled in the waves of the sea to create something treasured and beautiful. Eating disorders are much the same way, going through amazingly rough times to come through with a beautiful story. 
Helping adolescents and adults overcome eating disorder behaviors is Erica's goal in life, and she can't wait to take Project Sea Glass National. So I will now turn it over to Erica. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> You're good. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Erica? Good. I'm so excited to be here with everyone. So, Erica, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your story and your recovery journey? Okay. So, um, I was at Renfrew, um, I say, almost four years ago in August. And um, I'm just so excited to be here, like talking to everybody. And it's just, it's so funny how things just come like full circle. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about everything in my life. Um, I kind of, I just like write it down because it's like such a long, not really a long story, but it's just my own personal story. And I, I have, kind of repress things. So um, here I go. Um, ever since I can remember, I've had family members constantly asking how much I weighed. I didn't know what to say to that and I didn't think it was out of the ordinary. But from a really young age, it didn't sit well with me. No more questions were asked of me except for my weight. I thought this was normal at the time. I was involved in dance and theater in elementary school and middle school. It was competitive and while being critiqued, that can be a good thing, but this was on another level. The talent was there, but I couldn't really compete in the looks department. I had ugly duckling syndrome. While that took a hit, I grew out of it pretty quickly. I didn't have anyone to navigate me through it. I didn't have anyone to listen. I was alone. My mom started putting makeup on me at a very young age in a, you really need this kind of way. From that point on, you never saw me with a clean face from sunup to sundown. Every morning I was just constantly like, how do I do this? How do I fit in with everyone? I just, I couldn't be who I was. In middle school, as we all may know, was a battleground. Nothing was off limits hair, clothing, weight, just name it. I had friends, but they were the wrong kinds of friends. They critiqued every single part of my body, like including my armpits. Like I didn't know armpits like could be critiqued. It was crazy. They criticized the food I ate. They put gum and paper in my hair. They put gum in the seat of my desk. Like, I don't know how many times I called my family to come bring me a fresh pair of clothes, like especially jeans when you're putting gum in people's seats. Like I just needed to change. And finally, at the end of middle school, I auditioned for the varsity dance team and I made it, but the rest of my like friends did not make it. And so the middle schoolers formed like this ring around me to congratulate me. And then all at the same time, they threw their drinks at me and just kind of ran away. And I thought, you know, the beginning of high school would be a lot of the same way, but it, it was totally different. I had um, my whole group of like dance team and I really got into dance a lot and working out and exercising so I was I was really scared at first but I was ready to to just kind of move on but in the back of my head I still had those same girls that were doing the same things to me um I wasn't really food restricting at the time but I was working out a whole lot um I did have these uniforms that I had to fit into. So that was kind of a body thing that I had started, but I wasn't restricting. Um, peak puberty, that's when things really started changing for me because I was kind of late at it. Um, I started around the middle of high school. 
I had some like friends that were friends on my team that were, they had graduated and that was really hard for me because, you know, they had taught me so many things that, that were wise and, you know, really start getting into college and start looking at things. And that really gave me hope and they were gone. I didn't really have that anymore. So um, I just felt kind of numb. I was captain at that point. So that's whenever I really started working out more and I started looking at my body more. Um, I was gaining weight. I, I really hated it. I would eat here and there. Um, I had a busy schedule with dance and AP classes. Um, I stuck to granola bars and occasionally my mom would like send me to school with like diet pills and I didn't really think anything of it because I was going with her to like her weight loss little classes and stuff, which was popular back then. And um, I wasn't taking the weight loss classes, but my whole family was doing like these weight loss shakes and stuff like that. And when you see your family so much doing so much of that, it really like ingrains in you. It's diet culture, diet culture really, it can sneak up on you. Um, my junior year, I was selected to graduate early in 10 Savannah College of Rent and Design. And this was like peak 2000s. So supermodels and thin bodies were all the rage. I had incredible roommates. I'm so grateful I had really good roommates. But we posted photos of like super thin, like models and, you know, Britney Spears and all kinds of celebrities on our fridge so that we wouldn't be tempted to open the fridge. Um, I went to the dining hall only once in all the years that I had attended college. So um, that tells you a lot. Uh, we didn't or we did have a scale in our dorm. And so we would keep track of like everything, you know, are we, are we losing weight, you know? Um, none of this was healthy, but I didn't see, I didn't see what was happening until later. Um, so moving on to my adult life, um, I was absolutely obsessed with my weight and image. The only time I had a small breather when I was pregnant but it was still on my mind. Um, I couldn't stand it whenever I saw the scale. Um, when my daughter came home from the hospital, um, I, it, like it kicked in full force. Um, I fed her everything that she needed, but it was like the opposite of like a mirror for me. Um, I ate just enough to like survive like just enough. And I would like, while she was sleeping, I would like work out while she was sleeping and we would go for walks and for like miles and miles and miles. And it was just, I, I was drained. I was completely drained. And then, um, a little bit later, this was like a, a few years later, um, I had gone to the doctor and I had like a really bad iron deficiency, which <laughs> obviously I had an iron deficiency. And um, I've been like lying to my doctor. I've been keeping secrets. I had kept so many secrets. Like I can't tell you how many secrets I've kept, how many times I have lied. It was exhausting. Um, but I was put on shots. I had to like administer them myself, like just these B12 shots because I wasn't getting enough food. And um, I had excuses. I never told anyone about like the restricting I was doing, any kind of like purging I had ended up doing, like if I had restricted or had not restricted. Um, by the third visit to the doctor, um, you know, she sat me down she was like, she knew what was happening. 
And of course I denied it. And she went on to say that she wouldn't be treating a dying patient anymore if I wasn't willing to get some help. So I had a lot of like crying and saying no. And then finally like giving in, but then being like, she'll never know if like I go or not. And then saying no again. And it was just, it was crazy. It was wild. Um, then I finally went to a nutritionist thinking I can do this like on my own. And even the nutritionist was like, "Mm -mm. like, I'm, I'm not doing this unless you actually go get some help. And then she told me, actually, she gave me this book. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's called Sick Enough. She gave me her own copy of Sick Enough. And she's like, you don't understand where you're at right now. Like, you need to go and I will drive you there. And so I was like, no, okay, finally, I'll go, I'll go. And so I ended up going. And um, let's see, I like I, my first day at Renfrew was like getting, um, I, I don't know, I, I wrote it so eloquently, but um, like they answered a lot of questions for me. And when I was in that room, I was scared to death. And they were like, you need to be impatient. And I was like, I don't want to be impatient, but you know, I just refuse to do that. And she was like, well, you know, there is like outpatient programs where you can still work. Like you could just take all the time you need off work. And then we can like, you know, do what we need to do. And your insurance will cover it. And you just have to just, you just have to do this. And so finally, it's crazy how some stuff works because I've been a dancer my whole life. And I've been like a professional ballerina my whole life. And she had a painting of a pair of point shoes in the corner of her room. And we had started talking about it and I was like okay maybe these aren't like the evil people that I think they were you know trying to like make me do things that I didn't want to know but that day was like okay maybe I need to do this and I'm not one person like to believe in like signs and stuff like that but that made made me think like I need to do something about this. So I had um, I had decided to go into like the outpatient rehab in Charlotte, North Carolina. So um, okay, so that was after the assessment. And then when I had gotten in there, I didn't realize like how much hair I was losing. Um, I couldn't walk up to my like third floor apartment anymore. It was just getting so hard. Um, my stomach hurt constantly. And like you guys helped me get the help that I needed to be able to go like get my stomach ulcers helped because I didn't realize that like restricting so much and like typically I didn't like purge as much but like I didn't realize how much that could take so much of a toll on your stomach and so once we figured that out I had already starting feeling better like in the first week it was crazy um so it took like a day or two to learn like how everything's going on. Um, everyone was like so welcoming. I brought a journal with me. I highly recommend a journal to anybody that goes into treatment or if you're in treatment or if you're out of treatment. Like I have shelves of journals that helps me like realize what I'm thinking or feeling at the moment or maybe later like 
it's journals are amazing. Um, so being in a group setting really answered a lot of questions that I had. Um, when you're around your people, you can be like honest about yourself and they can be honest about themselves and the entire dynamic just changes. Um, we had one-on-one -on -one therapy, we had group therapy. Um, it, and being around those people like really helped me figure out what I was feeling. And um, we had like worksheets and stuff. And you know what guys, I still have these worksheets. Like, look how thick this is. I refer to them all the time. It's so insane. And maybe other people don't, but I do. And it helps me to this day. Um, so I came to find out that a lot of my like eating disorder tendency came from like trauma and the need to control. And I didn't have control in my life. Um, I had a lot of trauma that I really needed to, to get to the root of. So I had a trauma therapist um, while I was there that, oh my God, I dreaded going to, I dreaded it. But because of that, I know myself now and I know where I stand, why this happened and where everything came from. Um, let's see, we had, we had art therapy. So you guys have like really cool art therapists. Um, that was like my favorite day in like every two weeks. Um, we had yoga therapy, um, all kinds of therapy, but okay. My favorite was mindfulness and you guys walking in there every morning to do mindfulness was I was like, okay, what are we doing for like five minutes today, guys? This is going to be mindfulness, right? What are we doing? Are we doing the breathing? Are we doing the, like, the tapping? And I, like, I was so sarcastic about it too. And um, like to this day, whenever I feel like I'm having like a panic attack, come on, what do I do? I do mindfulness. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm that person, like, that I used to make fun of it, and now this is what, like, keeps me alive, so you'll do it, too. You guys, like, will we'll do one thing, at least, coming out of here, and you'll be like, okay, I see, I see. Um, anyway, so those those groups of people, like they became my sisters. We even called ourselves like the renegades. Like that sounds lame, but it's, it was just like the coolest having people just to talk to and that understood you. Um, the therapist that I had there though, like you all deserve rewards for putting up with like all of us, especially me because like the first time that I went in there, I was like, I'm not doing this. I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna learn this. I was just so upset. And then I, I just finally had people to lean on and I knew I could trust them. And so I would just be like, can we have like an extra five minutes? Like I've got something to tell you today. And um, in a twist of fate, like, I saw a former therapist from Renfrew um, at the Nita Walk. And it's just amazing how much comes around. And it was so good to see each other after four years. And like we hugged and we hugged and we hugged. And I was just, it's just, I was so taken aback by how much someone can change your life. And now she remembers me from that long ago. And like, they do remember you and I remember them and they just changed my life. It was just the coolest thing. Um, I, 
I don't know. I also have the same um, psychiatrist that I met at Renfrew. Um, she has always been amazing. Um, I don't think she's there anymore, but going into like a new session and having someone just listen to you instead of just being like, well, here's this, um, I'll see you for five minutes and like, and just walk on out. Having someone truly listen to you, that, that does change your life because you never know what kind of life that you come from. And someone reaching out and really saying that they care about you, they do care about you. And I know people have said that in your life before, but it's true. If someone says they care about you, they, they will truly sit down and talk to you and care about you. And that made a huge difference. Um, I do have a wonderful therapist that I see bi-weekly. Um, I see her tomorrow and I can't wait. Um, and you know, I say to people like having a therapist is a lot like dating. Um, you may not find that like perfect therapist, the very first therapist that you get, but um, you do have to maybe search around and see like, am I good for this therapist? Or is she good for me? Like, are we compatible? And it doesn't have to be a woman therapist like me, like it can be anybody, but um, don't just go find a therapist out on the street. Like don't pick any person out on the street because they're probably not a licensed therapist, but just find like a therapist like on, psychology today that's a really great place to find a therapist and you know go see them and do like a test run if that doesn't work out they're not for you that's fine just go find another one and don't give up don't give up on it because it's so easy to be like I've seen these three people already like you know it's just not for me it totally is for everyone like everyone in this world should have a therapist no joke. Like I say that to everybody. Um, find a nutritionist. Um, at least at first, it's really good to have a nutritionist because it's so easy to relapse. Um, I think I don't have the statistic for the relapsing right now, um, but I know it's very high. And there are some days that I just, I feel like that. Like it's so easy to go back into the same mindset and you just have to like rewire your brain. And if you don't have someone to talk to about that, it could very easily happen. So um, I do highly recommend a nutritionist. And you know what? I highly recommend that they're really funny too. Because if you go in there and like someone's just talking to you, you're going to be bored to death. But find a really, really funny one. Um, I had a great one who was just hilarious. And I loved her. Like, I love her to that. So um, that would be really cool if you could like find someone funny and that you're compatible with. Because that makes the biggest difference. Um, Uh, well, our body needs fuel, obviously. Our brain needs fuel. Without it, we shut down. And personally, I ended up with osteoporosis at 30 years old, had stomach ulcers. I still have like horrific migraines. Um, I now have seizures. I'm not sure if that's like related, but we found out that I was having like these weird seizures before. Um, so I still suffer the consequences and I had to get over that it was like my fault that I did this um, because it's not my fault. And if any of that happens to anyone else, um, it's not 
it's not something that you need to put the blame on yourself for. Um, Cause it can feel like that. It can really feel like, well, I did all this, like I'm not like a good person or whatever. Like, no, you have to like reevaluate that and look at it as like, this was my story. This is what I went through. I'm never going to go down that road again. And just really think about it and know that you're not going to go down that road. And use that as like future fuel, fuel for like the thoughts that you have. Like you don't want to go back. And that can be so easy to do. Just don't do it. And I know it's so easy to say, like, from this point, like, just don't do it. But it's a battleground. Like, every day is a battleground. And every morning you wake up, just take those tiny, tiny steps. Because it's all about taking, like, the small step, hour by hour by hour. And, like, you can fight yourself every second of every day. But eventually, those days get a tiny bit easier, just a little bit easier. I promise you, it gets a little bit easier every day. Erica, thank you so much for sharing about your story and kind of your journey in recovery. I think it's so important, um, you know, for people to understand that, like, you know, it's going to be different for everyone and it doesn't stop just when you leave treatment, you know, there's yeah. still more to do. What is your advice, um, for anyone kind of currently either in treatment or maybe thinking about starting treatment for their eating disorder? Like if you could go back and say something, or you could say something to them now, what would, what would that advice be? Okay. So, um, I think it's more like people need other people. Um, asking for help is the hardest thing that you will ever do. Um, admitting that you need help is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, I just remember crying, just crying and being in denial. And um, so going into treatment was, was super difficult. Um, it'll be like the bravest thing that you'll ever do. And I think that's beautiful. Like, I think it's gorgeous. Um, it's so good to like let all the secrets go and not having to lie anymore. So while, while you're in treatment, that's a good habit to break because you don't have to worry about being like lying and saying like, oh, I had dinner already or... <laughs> You know, I just, I don't really feel like eating anymore, but really inside you were just starving. Like you were exhausted. Like it, I was so tired of that. I was tired of dragging that around all the time that I had so many secrets. And now I'm just, I feel open and I'm just like, I don't have anything like that burdens me or holds me down because I don't have to lie about anything anymore and it's so good to be your authentic self and just be like look um I would really really like like some of that chocolate over there is that cool like <laughs> that just feels good you know um currently in treatment use those resources that you you have right now 
like really lean into it. Um, because once you leave, it won't be easier to have those resources. And I have found that difficult afterwards. Um, because maybe there's something else that, you know, I really needed, like, um, like I, I would love to help myself with some more trauma that maybe I've experienced. And although I have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful therapist, um, she can only do so much, you know? So it's like, if I had a team around me, I really think that that would be so much better so that I could ask like, hey, do you know someone here? Or do you know someone here? And while I was there, I wish I had a like, some days just put more into it, you know? Like ask more questions or be like, oh, I've got to see the nutritionist again. Like really ask like, okay, so when I go to the grocery store, how do I do this? Or what do I do for this? Because I know this sounds crazy, but I wasn't like raised going to the grocery store. Like it, it was like fast food for us, like going from piano lessons to like, you know, ballet and stuff like that. Um, I didn't know how to go to a grocery store until I had a nutritionist go with me one time. But still, that was one time, you know? So just stuff like that, you know, really ask questions that you're going to need after treatment. So, yeah. Yeah. How have you handled body image in recovery? Okay, so body image, um, it did take a little bit of time because I was used to going from grabbing like one size that I wanted. And I was like, oh, this is my size, this is my size. But as we all know, like for women's clothing, it's, you can be like, you could see one size and it'll be another size, like at another store, you know? That's not my point. My point is like, I was used to grabbing, grabbing like the standard size and being like, huh, so I'm not that anymore. And it would make me kind of like wanna, like wanna fall back a bit. But at the same time, I was like, no, we're not, we're not going there. It's okay. It's fine. So what I did, I went to, I remember I did this, um, like during my last days, um, when I was at Renfrew and I had spoken to my therapist about it. And I was like, I, I just, I don't know what to do about it. And it was, um, I think it's called exposure therapy, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exposure therapy. She was like, why don't you just go um, buy a couple of out outfits that actually fit you and just see, see what it feels like. And so I did that. And then I started thrifting again and I, I got just enough outfits to like last me a little bit and mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing this and like layering what I still can wear on top. And um, I did that. And then I decided I'm just going to donate the clothes that I don't wear anymore because how is that benefiting me? If I see something that's like the size that I was sitting there, that's tempting, right? Like I, I can't do that anymore. And so now every time that I do like gain some weight, which isn't super scary anymore, like it, it's always going to be there. I'm not going to lie. Um, I 
have like a time of donation. And so I get rid of the pieces that I can't wear anymore that maybe I know like I will never get rid of anymore or, or oh. that I can't wear anymore. And um and I'll just take those to to like Goodwill or um like a family crisis center and hopefully someone else can use them. But I, I can't go back to who I used to be. I've done too much hard work. So it sounds like Erica really like reminding yourself of like, we did a lot of work and like fitting back into these clothes is not worth letting go of that work that we've done. Yeah. I, I remember how bad I felt and now it's, it's a different feeling and I don't want to go through that anymore. Yeah. And you can help somebody else in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's such a great way to look at it. It's like, okay, I'm going to help myself and I'm going to help somebody else who might need some new pants or a new shirt or whatever, and they can have this. Yeah. And like 80s and 90s is it's in right now. So <laughs> thrifting is awesome. Like you don't have to pay a lot for it. So. Mm -hmm. Good. How, um, you spoke a little bit about, you know, when you came home from the hospital with your daughter and you were really focused on taking care of her, not so much taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. What kind of helped you recognize that maybe there was, you know, a deficit in how you were taking care of yourself? Was it the outpatient providers? Was it that doctor's office you kind of talked about? What kind of helped you notice like, okay, in order to take care of her, maybe I do have to take care of myself too. Um, it wasn't immediately at all. It was, it was up until not even like a year before I went into Renfrew because like on my way to, to like ballet class and stuff, I would, like, I would wear her leggings. Like, she was seven years old. And for, like, a 29, 30 years old, I feel like that's weird, being able to, like, borrow my daughter's leggings to go to class. Like, I don't know. It, something in me kind of stirred. But at the same time, I was like, okay, like we can borrow each other's clothes, you know, but it wasn't, I don't know, it didn't really seem right, but I was so deep into it, you know, like I didn't even recognize until other people had to say something. Mm -hmm. What are some of like the, the guidelines or the rules you kind of set up for yourself in recovery to help continue to support that work so you don't fall backwards? Because I think to your point, like it is really hard when it's like, oh yeah, I wasn't even really aware of what was going on. I was so deep in it. So like, what are some of those guidelines or rules you have set up? Okay, so... Um... rules I don't like people to talk about weight around me um I just I don't I just don't like it um and I will say that to people um I'll walk away from the situation if it's like diet related or if it's like weight loss related, um, that's a boundary for me. Mm -hmm. um, I will talk about it, you know, with my nutritionist or my therapist um, or my psychiatrist, because obviously that's important. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to go non-contact -con with people if 
they just won't drop it. Um, for instance, I have family members that are just constantly like dieting and and won't drop things about image mm -hmm. and I cannot I can't be around this this family ever anymore um and I wish it wasn't that way mm -hmm. and that's painful mm -hmm. um but for my own health I can't do it because I know I know where I would end up and um I don't know. I think it's important to take care of your health instead of just trying to make people happy. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And also, um, I don't believe in scales. Um, like when I'm at the doctor's office, I will ask them not to weigh or not weigh me. Um, I know they need my weight for like, you know, medical stuff, but I will ask them not to like tell me what my weight is, or I will ask to like turn around so that I can't see the weight because that's not benefiting me. Like it depends on how I feel. Like I just want want to live my life without like really knowing what's going on um I've had them like accidentally tell me but I don't like obsess over it like I did anymore because now I have like skills yeah I think that's so great you know just to have those boundaries and be really firm with like okay we're not I'm like I'm not being a part of this conversation like if this is something that like is really that important to your life like we've got different values I'm going to take a step back yeah um, what do you think helped because I know you and I talked previously kind of before this and you talked yeah. about the people pleasing and trying to make other people happy what do you think has helped you to kind of take a step back from that and say all right, I'm not focusing on pleasing others. I'm going to focus on doing what makes sense for me. Okay, so that one's like really difficult and I'm still working on that one. Um, like, <sighs> this one still takes time with, with my therapist and it's just, I just want to say that no is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. And people are still, still learning that. And I just think it's so important for people to have boundaries um and I am not a therapist but I of course think everyone should have one but being able to talk to someone that can show you what a boundary is is so so important um there are things that in your life people will cross a line we do you don't show them where it is because they don't know if it's a boundary if you don't tell them or show them what the boundary is um there is consent in your life in more ways than one um when you say no again it's a complete sentence like n-o period complete sentence um if something makes me uncomfortable or it's not benefiting me um then I will say no 
because it's not if it's not for someone that I care about or if it's not for for the benefit of someone else then I'm not going to be in an uncomfortable situation because how is that going to help anyone? Mm-hmm. It's not going to help anyone at all. Mm-hmm. So really set boundaries and talk about your boundaries. Tell people when you're uncomfortable. Um, there's no point in, in being uncomfortable. Like this all goes back to being like your authentic self. Um, talk about what you feel, why you feel it, and how you want to go forward with it. Mm-hmm. I think that's so, so important. And like I said, it has taken me years to learn this, but it is one of the biggest things that I've had to learn in my life. Well, and I do think it's such a, like, it's a, can feel like a constant struggle almost of like oh, wanting to fall yeah. back into it. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, it, it's hard. It takes a lot of reminding. And like you said, people don't always respect those boundaries. And so then it's like, I yeah. I've got to do it even more. And just being able to say like, okay, you know, I loved when you said it, it's not helping anyone for me to stay in that situation if it's not really what I want. Um, You know, if it's not really serving me, then no, I'm I'm not going to be doing the best for the other person even. So Mm -hmm. even if I'm trying to people, please maybe reminding myself that it's not going to work if I'm not actually in a values-driven situation that's personal to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about, um, you know, you are in the pageant world. How have you oh, yeah. kind of balanced? Like, okay, I'm, I've got this title. I'm in the pageant world. I can use this as a platform. Mm-hmm. And I'm also in recovery. And we know that the pageant world has some stereotypes to it mm-hmm. and some ideas around it or about it. And kind of, how do you balance those two worlds so this is the most like random thing that I've ever done um well probably not that I've ever done but it's been so random um I never thought I would be in this situation um I did like a like a high school pageant when I was younger and then after this is crazy, but I had back surgery last year because of my um, dancing and everything. And so I was just, I was lost. I didn't know what to do with my life. And I was like, I was like, let's, let's see if we can do this, you know? And I cannot believe that I won. It was the, I was like, me? (laughs) Oh my God. Like, I just, you guys, for real, I just fell down the steps this morning. Um, I couldn't believe that I won because I fall all the time. So I really feel like I'm Miss Congeniality. Like you, you guys know that movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I feel like that's happening right now. Um, so um, the thing is, there's a whole platform situation, right? And I was like, what if I made myself extremely uncomfortable, but at the same time, I get to do really great things. Like nobody ever listens to me like in my normal life, but what if I get to advocate for other people and I get this platform? So I thought about it and thought about it and I just kind of like jumped off that cliff and I just started like putting all these like 
names out there and like all of this stuff that I've been through, which and his like this this has been so scary because I had never told my story before any of this. I didn't think it was shameful, but I didn't think the world needed to know it. And the more and more I tell my story, the more people tell me, oh, I went through that too. Mm -hmm. And how incredible is that, that we are creating a community of people that are being honest about themselves and their lives. And it's just, I don't know, it's just incredible to me that there's so many of like us out there and it'd be really nice for all of us to really start just talking to each other and and just really supporting each other like that's amazing Mm -hmm. and um so I started like speaking more about it and I just really wanted to to get more attention around eating disorders in general Mm -hmm. um because I I don't think enough light shines on eating disorders Mm -hmm. like there's so much hell that we go through and you know it's this second like deadliest mental disease out there and um we've just got to do more. I mean, we live such secret lives. We lie all the time. And all of this is like before we get help, of course, but you never know who's in front of you and they're suffering and they won't tell you. They will not tell you. And um, I just really think it's super important to just get that story out there and just just do it, you know, like it's scary as help, but get that help, you know? So that's why when I won, I decided to just really jump off that cliff and just, you know, do it. And I feel like this is kind of the ultimate, like, have you heard the sunscreen song? No. Okay, it's the sunscreen song by like Baz Marvin. And it's like do everything, do one thing every day that scares you, that type of thing. Uh-huh. Well, this is like my year of like doing things that scare me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm afraid to talk in front of people. Like I'm afraid of like walking in front of people. I'm gonna be on a stage in a swimsuit in front of people. And you know what? I'm not dieting. Di- I'm not dieting for it. I'm not like restricting for it. Like I've got to wear high heels. What? <laughs> so, like it's just gonna be a fun time, and I get to like you know partner with Renfrew. I get to. It's all full circle, you know but I'm not going to be ashamed of my body in front of people. I'm not doing it. I, I came from like near death to look, I get to help bring like this message to people about what it looks like from when you begin to recover from something so harmful. And that's all I wanted to do. And I'm just, I'm really excited for everything that I've done this year and being with you guys. And I just think it's the coolest thing I've ever done. Well, and I think that's such a great way to kind of like balance, like the pressure that could come up is to have like this very real, um, like, uh, motivator of like I'm doing this for this platform to get the word out to not have it be a secret to not have people hiding Mm -hmm. these things but to be able to talk about it and that's why Eric I was so happy when you agreed to share your story with our group today Um, and I know we're kind of at time so 
Erica, I just, again, want to thank you so much. For thank you. I've had so much fun. Yes, this has been great. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you at some of the rebroadcasts this summer or one of our events or at our live webinars in the fall. So again, on behalf of the Renfrew Center Foundation, thank you so much, Erica, for sharing today. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your day.